Hello, hello, hello. Can uh, can everybody hear me okay? Hello, Tracy from Ontario in Canada. Ruthann, good evening. Hello, hello. Can everybody hear me? Just let me know in the chat because um, this is the first time I've ever done this. Uh, so I've no idea uh, whether it's working or not. Hopefully it is. Uh, and hopefully I'm not... Uh, uh, I'm not going to be left out in the cold talking to myself. Can anybody hear me? We've got 12 people apparently at the moment watching this, which is fantastic. I never thought initially streaming doesn't attract a very large audience, which is great for me because uh, all those that do join tonight can laugh along at all the mistakes. But uh, please be caring with your judgment. Yes, Ruth Ann, yes, you can hear me. Sound is good, Diana. Good evening, Diana. And is it TS? I don't know if it's TS or M. Sorum, I don't know how you pronounce that. I'm pretty useless. Good evening. Marilyn, thanks for joining. Hello, hello, hello. And uh, welcome along to this uh, first ever live stream uh, from, uh, from me, uh, John, and History Roadshow. Uh, and I do hope... Uh, that you can uh, stay until the very end when I've got an exclusive sneak peek of my upcoming video this weekend. Hello, everybody. I'm going to, I'm, I'll just let everybody know now there is a, a time delay on this. I don't know if it's about 10, 15 seconds. So I'm getting messages through probably before you're hearing my reply, if that makes any sense. But there is definitely a time delay on this. And it's something I've just not been able to uh, completely work out. But anyway, I will try and uh, answer as many questions and opinions and everything else you've got over the coming. Hopefully, this should last for about 45 minutes. It may, it may or may not. Uh, a few more to say hello to. There's quite a few. I'm really surprised how many of you have turned up for this. Robert, good evening, Robert. Anita, hello, Anita. Aunt Maddie has arrived <laughs> in the building, so uh, everybody's in for a laugh now that Maddie's arrived. So, um, before uh, we go on, uh, we've done the checks. Everybody can hear me. Everybody can see me okay. Uh, the other thing I will be mentioning, I'm not going to be going down the road uh, to make any jokes tonight. 
uh, uh, if you've seen uh, the video my top 10 Tudor tragedies uh, you'll uh, you'll know there's more than enough puns and one-liners there to make uh, everybody cringe so there'll be no jokes no one-liners it's uh, it's not going to be serious though because I mean I'm doing this and it's a bit of a struggle However, I will be throwing some questions at you starting with this one, so I look forward to see what you think. Um, we're talking about Elizabeth the first tonight, uh, and what I'd like to know straight off, this is just to get us going, does anybody know what Elizabeth's favourite drink was? So there you go, so I'm throwing that one out to you, and then we'll crack on. So does anybody know what Elizabeth's favourite drink was? And I'll just wait and sit here for a moment and see if we get any, any replies. There's nothing coming through yet. I have got a delay on this. Let me just look on here. Definitely got a delay on it somewhere. Anyway, no, no ideas, anybody? Small L, not bad. It's actually, <laughs> it do bunny. It's actually royal tea. It's it's not even funny. Royal tea. There you go. It's royal tea. That's what it is. Anyway, with all that nonsense out of the way, uh, we've got enough people in. 20 people, I'm really surprised. Oh, nine, 20. Yeah, 20 people in the room now. Um, so, with that, all that, like I said, with all that nonsense out of the way, uh, let's get on with this uh, live stream. Good evening and welcome to my very first live stream here on YouTube. My name is John and I'm the sole person responsible for hopefully bringing a little history into your lives in the form of stories telling and illustrating with images that hopefully help everyone uh, have a picture of sorts in their head of what it may have just been like on in those long lost days now today uh, the aim of this particular stream is I'm going to be covering my last video based upon the life and times of Elizabeth the first and as we know it was a challenging time for all concerned and the Elizabethan era is still very much a controversial part of English history so with that said thank you again for joining and uh, what is royalty Corinne royalty royal tea it's a joke let's move on um, so feel Please feel free, drop some questions in. I will do my very best to keep up with everything you're saying there. Uh, and like I say, have a chat amongst yourselves if you have an opinion. And uh, <laughs> Maddy Boo. Um, have a, if you have an opinion, anything, by all means, drop it in, in the chat. Uh, so, like I said, the aim of this stream is to go through the life of Elizabeth and try and untangle some of the key moments of that period. So, for those of you who may not have seen uh, the video I did, I'm going to play a few clips tonight, then we'll have a little chat about uh, that particular period. But just to get things going, here's a little uh, short trailer that we made, and we normally send these out to Twitter or Facebook or somewhere like that. So just to get you, uh, give you a little insight into the video, here is a very quick 60-second trailer uh, about Elizabeth I. She was the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. When her big day finally arrived on the 17th of November, 1558, it would see the start of a reign that would last over 40 years. After years of pain, the crown was now hers. Pretty unbelievable situation to find herself, given all that had transpired beforehand. Elizabeth never knew her mother's love. As for her father, he was always preoccupied with other events and had little time for his daughter. It would be the start of a golden age, so much so that even today the times are still known as the Elizabethan era. Join me now as we look at the unbelievable life of Elizabeth I.
Oh dear. Can everybody hear me now? I think I were on mute. I told you I'd make a mistake. I'll read it all out again to you. Can everybody hear me? Hello, hello. Yes, cool. <laughs> hey, see? I, I knew. I just knew I would make a mistake. Right, we're going to start again. So hopefully, as I said after that little video, uh, that little clip, uh, that gives you a brief insight into Elizabeth. As we all know, she was born on the 7th of September, 1533, and would eventually reign as a monarch uh, from the 17th of November, 1558, until her death on the 24th of March, 1603, which means tomorrow, the 24th of March, will be 419 years to the day. Everybody can hear me. Fantastic. Um, so it seems quite fitting that we're here tonight to talk about her. She would go on to spend 44 years on the throne, and it's quite an achievement, even by modern-day standards. And as we know, she was a charismatic lady and a survivor who overcame many obstacles in life. But a life and monarchy, that stabilised England. And you could say, due to events, uh, turned it around, uh, turned it England into a world force, and more so after the Armada. Kiss care. You are the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kiss so if I get these names wrong, I apologise. Moving on, we're now going to have a look at some of the more turbulent periods of Elizabeth and the ones that quite possibly brought her the greatest sense of anxiety. So, to start the stream properly, I guess now, without being muted and so everybody can hear me, uh, we're, we're going to have a look at how Henry eventually decided on what should be done with the succession after his death. The final years of Henry's life proved to be amongst the most peaceful of his reign. His acts of settlement now concluded and they gave a firm transition line as to who would be the ruler. Firstly Edward, then Mary, and finally Elizabeth would follow if all went to plan. But all this seemed a long way off for now. It's quite possible Elizabeth, just enjoying life, never gave it a second thought. But after Henry died, Edward Seymour, the Earl of Hertford, almost immediately changed the king's dying wishes, and he planned to control the kingdom himself. Go, there we go, there we go, there we go. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the first part. Uh, it's a strange old story, really, I guess. Elizabeth, in her early years, uh, kind of struggled on, on all sorts of fronts, but she was only three years old when her mother died. Uh, and when her father died, she was only just 13 at the time. Now, Henry's last will and testament are open to debate, although in theory, he ordered what he thought, to, uh, he ordered, yeah, what he thought to be a, a rightful course for the Tudor family to take. So we had Edward, uh, and then Mary, and finally Elizabeth. Well, that was his plan, but uh, as we all know, Plans are there to be broken at times. Uh, and in 1544, a further act of succession was passed. This time it included all the names I've just mentioned, but also it include, uh, to include any children that Henry may have with his final wife, Catherine Parr. But again, that was a very unlikely scenario under the circumstances and Henry's obvious ill health towards the end of his life. Uh, but both Mary and Elizabeth had been reinstated, although they were still regarded as illegitimate. So what we have now is, I guess, a, a bigger picture evolving here on the whole succession stage, with firstly Edward and his heirs, Mary and hers, and then finally Elizabeth and hers. But uh, would Elizabeth actually get that far? Because obviously Edward was still young at that point. But problems began after his death when it was discovered his will had not been signed by Henry. But what is known, and I don't know if you guys have heard of this before, it's known as a dry stamp. So basically, it's, I guess it's very similar today when you go to the post office and you hand them a letter and they stamp it, uh, and then you get the, the imprint of the stamp on there. But then somebody came along with the old quill and ink and decided to fill it in and give the impression that it was actually Henry's signature, when of course it wasn't. Now this would cause untold problems in the years ahead, but for our Elizabeth, well, she really must have thought she'd never been monarch anyway, due to the fact young Edward, like I said, was only around for a short time, and as we know, he died at a very young age of just 15. Now we know 
after Edward passed that there was a battle ensuing between Lady Mary and Lady Jane Grey, with Mary coming out on top, and both Grey and, let's call him, uh, let's call her instigator, Northumberland, would eventually overrun. Now, the Privy Council realised they had made a devastating error of judgement and would then fully support Mary, who went on to become Queen. But again, like Edward's reign, Mary's, although, although hers was, uh, how can I put it, Mary's reign was bloody, yeah, we'll put it that way. Again, would only be a short period of just five years. Uh, and Mary, by then, was around 37 years old, and really, in those days, uh, she was past the point of hopefully delivering any children. Yet she would marry Philip of Spain. But we think, uh, and I say we, I think people who have got some idea on this, and some of you guys obviously have, a, have an opinion on this, that uh, the reason for her marrying Philip of Spain was quite possibly to help reinforce Catholicism in the country after the days of Henry's Reformation and the Church of England. So it, it does beg the question, Elizabeth must have been thinking, well, now it's me, I'm next in line. And after a, a big intake of breath, uh, from Edward coming to the throne in 1547 to herself becoming queen, it was just 11 short years. So all this happened suddenly for Elizabeth. You know, it, it was like whoosh. It, from one minute, she's probably thinking, I'm never, ever going to get into that position. And probably she thought she was just going to get married off to a foreign prince or something and, and live her days out somewhere else. I mean, who knows? But um, it would be a half-sister Mary who would be monarch. And at this point, Elizabeth was around 20 years old. But even then, she must have been feeling, like I've said, some trepidation at what might happen. So let's. Uh, I'm just going to have a quick look at this chat thing. It's flying up and down here. Uh, and I'm trying to keep up with everybody. Um, let's have a look. Um, buh, 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 buh. Any questions? The world of Bernard, I understand Mark's Mary's anger. What is that? Yeah, yeah, Jody, Jody, I think it's Jody. Yeah, Mary, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, she had a sad life. Uh, poor, poor Mary, quite correct, Maddie. Uh, anybody else? King's France, Mary had a miserable life. Yeah, to be fair, yeah, she did. Not a great one at all. Now, again, I've not created a video on Mary the First, but it's something uh, I will do in the future. Uh, she led a very active life, as did all the characters back then. But uh, we'll talk about Mary, possibly, on a, another occasion. So, Mary's reign ended on the 17th of November, 1558. Uh, and the following day, Elizabeth would become queen. So, questions. What challenges now lay ahead for this young 25-year-old? Would it be all plain sailing? Well, apart from the Armada... And it's now we move on to quite possibly one of the biggest parts of her reign and a battle of wills with a lady north of the border. She was better known as Mary, Queen of Scots and her attempts to upset the party. After Mary died, her cousin Mary, Queen of Scots, who was at the time the wife of the Dauphin of France, had staked her claim to be the next queen. England now looked vulnerable and the old alliance between Scotland and France demonstrated its eagerness to control England fully. Fighting took place between the English and Scottish. By the end, England was victorious. Scotland gave in to the idea of Mary becoming queen and telling her to relinquish any thoughts and consider the matter closed. Yet upon the sudden death of Francis II in 1560, Mary returned to Scotland and refused to agree to the statements put out. She refused to sign the Treaty of Edinburgh unless Elizabeth accepted she would reign after the current monarch's death. These two ladies never met, yet their dissatisfaction with each other was clear to see. Yeah, it was clear to see. Uh, any questions coming while we've been watching that? Henry doesn't understand the damage he has caused, and even if he knew, I don't think he would care. Lorianne, you're probably quite right. Anyway, we're going to carry on about uh, Mary, Queen of Scots. And the main question, I guess to this is why did Mary pose such a major threat to Elizabeth? It was said although Mary was back in Scotland, she always had her, had her eyes on a bigger kingdom. So one of the biggest talking points in the time was the interaction between Elizabeth and Mary, Queen of Scots. And it's said that in a minority of Catholic viewpoints, 
they had the opinion that Mary should replace Elizabeth as the Queen. Now, reasons behind this were Elizabeth, in their eyes, was illegitimate, and so they felt she had no right to the throne. Catholics, of course, didn't recognise divorce, as Henry had done with Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn, and so viewed his second marriage as being illegal. But also that Mary would restore the uh, supremacy of the Catholic Church and put in reverse Elizabeth's religious settlement. And all in all, it, Mary was a considerable threat to Elizabeth, I guess not only on a home front, but also abroad. So what we're going to do now is have a quick look at what Mary, Queen of Scots, did upon her return to Scotland. What seemed on the surface, on the surface a good judgment call would end with an explosive outcome. The main problem that continued to destabilise Elizabeth was Mary of Scotland. Elizabeth did suggest she should marry her very own Dudley, by now the Earl of Leicester. But Mary had eyes on another man, this being Lord Darnley. He had descended from Queen Margaret's second marriage to the Earl of Angus, and was considered an English subject. This alone would make him even more unsuitable, in Elizabeth's view. But nothing would stop Mary, and she and Darnley were married in July 1565. But the marriage never took shape as Darnley was murdered, it is said on the orders of the Earl of Bothwell. A very, a very explosive ending to uh, Mary's first husband there, Lord Darnley. Um, and the options uh, open to Elizabeth. Uh, well, these. this is a question for you guys then. So she basically had three options about what to do with Mary. The first one, uh, she would certainly have felt troubled, as we all know, by these events. But she would have to wait at the consequences. Uh, so I'm going to have a quick look here at three options that Elizabeth had. Firstly, she could have got Mary out of the country, exiled her back to France. That was an option. But again, that may have caused more problems potentially down the road and Mary would have undoubtedly gained a gathering to fight back. So that was option number one. Uh, could Elizabeth keep Mary in prison? Well, again, yes, she could to a point. But it, again, it was risky. Uh, and holding someone unlawfully could also attract undue attention and possibly, once again, provoke attacks. Now, the third and final option was quite possibly the least sought, and that was to execute Mary. It would remove the Catholic figurehead, but uh, set a precedent for a queen killing another queen, although Elizabeth's father never did shy away from removing his own queens in this manner. But... Um, so Elizabeth was facing a very difficult choice and the story pans out further as we know there were other plots and uh, conspiracies which were taking place and Mary's supporters and Elizabeth's and all uh, at all with the same outcome uh, sorry I'll say that again I'll say that again <laughs> I'm getting my, I'm getting my tongue twisted um there were Mary's supporters and obviously Elizabeth's supporters but the Mary supporters all had the same outcome, which was uh, to remove Elizabeth. Now, in 1572, the Parliament of the day were now starting to place some pressure on uh, Elizabeth uh, in uh, to go with choice number three, the one to execute her, uh, basically in order to keep England, uh, people, and herself secure. And it ended with Mary, Queen of Scots, being tried, found guilty, and executed of treason, in 1587 and it's also said that the this is a, a, a terrible part of this it's said that the executioner um, when he decapitated the head of Mary held it up aloft and proclaimed long live the Queen I mean I can't even visualize anyone wanting to do that it's just it's awful it's just terrible but um, as we know this third option was not the option Elizabeth really wanted uh, and she did fear a backlash on and an not just a, a national scale but on an international scale uh, but what we do know is that a council went uh, behind her back to rid Mary once and for all and for those guys it was not a clever thing to do um, Elizabeth did sign the warrant uh, but never submitted it uh, and it would be a secretary that somehow managed to secret, uh, secretly get it out of the uh, the palace. And the Queen was unhappy and imprisoned the ones that went back. 
uh, that went without authority and behind her back and uh, you can only uh, you can only understand her rage uh, anyway we'll move on uh, one of the uh, I find this quite amusing uh, one of the things Elizabeth did was after after the uh, execution of Mary she did write an apologetic letter to King James for the death of his mother uh, you can make of that what uh, what you will um, but I find that quite amusing to be honest um, as it eventually unravelled Elizabeth didn't suffer luckily on the back of this judgement uh, France wanted to maintain uh, their alliance with England at the time uh, and they obviously feared Spain Spain were already at war uh, with England and they, they probably just couldn't care less and James was now on the throne in Scotland and uh, he took no action uh, he received his letter from the Queen uh, and uh, he must have been quite happy with the with the way of his life and the majority even of English Catholics remain loyal to Elizabeth so what could have been terminally uh, an impossible situation turned out in the end to be a big win for Elizabeth and her reign would continue and with all that said and without having a drink I need a drink uh, any questions coming up on here I need to sleep watch my typos King of France Kings of France needs to sleep Anything else? Anita. Times were awful back then. Yeah, they were Anita. Quite right. Aunt Maddie. Oh, she's just having a, a chat with Robert. Them two. They need to get a room, them two. Seriously. Um, private account. King James hated his mother. Well, yeah, you might be right there. Uh, so, what are we up to now? Let's have a quick look. Uh, for those that have recently joined, uh, if you've uh, you've not missed too much so far, we've been through. We've had a look at Henry's succession, and we've just basically covered uh, <laughs> Madder. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you're always nattering you too. Uh, we've and we've just covered Mary Queen of Scots, <laughs> so uh, we're going to move on now. Uh, and the next part, talking to Maddie and Robert, we're going to look at some of Elizabeth's lovers. Uh, and apart, of course, from Robert Dudley, the one man we think she was truly in love with, some other suitors did arrive at court. One ambassador at the time commented that Elizabeth would only ever love herself, although she wanted everyone to love her. Christopher Hatton was another gent at court who thrilled the Queen. He would write passionate love letters and be vying with the rest to gain her friendship, and above all else, her undying love. He said he would remain celibate for the sake and Elizabeth loved him for this. Dudley, alongside Hatton, both had mutual feelings for Elizabeth. However, a new pretender was about to enter court in 1581. He went by the name of Walter Raleigh. We'll get to good old Walter shortly. Um, yeah, apologies, uh, Maddie, and apologies, Robert, for making a, a you know a spectacle of you both I'll, I'll never do it again i promise um anything else on here i have to keep looking at these uh ba, 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 ba. i can't see anything there's no questions you guys seem to be having uh, a bit of fun between yourselves which is great i'm quite happy for you uh, to to do that uh, anyway let's go through some of these lovers that uh Elizabeth had. Uh, we're going to start with the one and the only Robert Dudley. Uh, <laughs> I should I shouldn't really say that. Uh, Robert Dudley. He had I guess he had much to thank Elizabeth for. Yet we all know his undying love for the Queen never went beyond the boyfriend girlfriend stage. Maddie, are you listening to this? Never went beyond anyway. Um, so we don't know why she never fully gave in to him, and I guess we'll never know. There are obviously opinions on this. And some do resonate as quite possibly being somewhere close to an answer. It is interesting. There is, in fact, one interesting theory about uh, about this couple. That if Elizabeth had married, well, not this couple in particular, but just Elizabeth and, and her potentially getting married. If she had married, she may well have lost her power. Uh, men ruled the roost in those days and it was her fear that uh, maybe the actions she took were justified. And it's a difficult question to answer. Maybe she didn't really care about who would succeed her because without marriage, there would be no heirs. And again, it's all open to debate. And I'm sure you guys all have an opinion on this. So feel free to drop those opinions in the chat and share your thoughts. Anything on there? Flirting is a lost art, Jodie. Jodie, 
It is a lost art, definitely. Uh, Robert, you're a lovely lady to see, you know what I mean? Robert, it never learns. You're a lovely lady, Maddie. Just carries on. Rule of thumb. Oh, oh, oh yeah. yeah. There's too much flirting going on in these chat rooms. Uh, anyway, so... <laughs> public gossip about Robert Dudley said he was arrogant, brash and married, which was the biggest problem. The point about Elizabeth saying she would have Dudley if he were not married brings into question the suspicious death of Dudley's wife at the time, a lady called Amy Robsart, uh, depicted in the famous painting laying at the foot of some stairs within the family home. And the image, if you've not seen it, is freely available online. Go and have a look at it. It's quite an interesting, uh, it's quite an interesting picture. It certainly uh, caused a scandal, uh, with an outcome being it had all been planned by Dudley himself. But uh, again, today, uh, this is a, a fact that's not widely supported, or a view, rather, that's not widely supported. So, does anybody think there was a conspiracy to kill his wife? What do you think? Maybe there was a conspiracy. Maybe Robert was behind it, uh, and so he could move in on... Uh, Queen Elizabeth will again it's one of those unanswered questions we'll never know I'm just trying to keep up with the chat stuff going on down here we have got 39 people I cannot believe 39 of you guys wonderful people oh it's just dropped 37 as soon as I said that <coughs> 37 but anyway anything over five I was just thinking it was going to be like five that's all and there's like 30 30 odd people turned up so thank you very much for your support for this live stream and me making numerous mistakes. Um, right, so we're going to move on from Robert Dudley. I think Robert's heard his name enough this evening. And we're going to have a quick, a very brief look at some of the other contenders for Elizabeth. Uh, the next one was Christopher Hudson. Now, he uh, had been noticed by Elizabeth and was quickly raised through the ranks at court. And it said he was a bit of a dancer. And certainly he was a poet uh, and would often write love letters to the Queen. Now, I'm not sure. I've been to Kirby Hall, but I'm not sure if it was Kirby Hall or Holden Bay where he actually invited Elizabeth to come and stay. But she never did, unlike a famous progress to Kenilworth, staying with Dudley. But the thing with Elizabeth was she always loved the adoration. She was smothered by men and couldn't get enough of their charms. And it seems... They all played into her hands, uh, but as we know, they all came up short eventually, and no one would ever prove to be that elusive husband many wanted her to have, except maybe this last chap we're going to have a, a quick word about. And uh, ladies in, uh, this is Tracy. Our ladies in waiting also told her rumours about how bad childbirth was, and that turned her off a little. And yeah, I, I can believe that because the uh, medical. The medical, um, uh, well, medically rather, not medical, not the medical, medically speaking, I guess in those days, it was always fraught with danger anyway. So yeah, I can quite easily go along with that sort of opinion. How could she be, the kings of France, how could she be queen and obedient at the same time? I, get, I don't know. I don't know. That's Nika, isn't it? Yeah, kings of, I'm saying kings of France, Nika. Uh, I don't know Nika, I guess... She could do what she wanted, basically. She had no one to turn to. Um, and I guess just her experience of life brought her to this point. Uh, and although she loved the adoration of men, she could go with any man she wanted, but she just never wanted to take it to that next stage. Maybe it was a fear of losing power. It might have just simply been that uh, she would have lost power to a man. He would have come in and taken over. And you've got to remember that when she was young... Thomas Seymour tried to make a very similar move to her in, in that respect uh, and he ended up being executed for his problems because his idea was not to just uh, uh, marry Elizabeth. He wanted to be king. He wanted to be in total control um, and that obviously backfired and it's maybe memories like that that come back to her over the years uh, and that stopped her doing it and stopped her even thinking about going down that particular road in future. But anyway, uh, let's get let's get back to Walter Raleigh. He was another one, in fact, who had attempted to win over this lady, uh, and he was certainly well favoured. 
by uh, Elizabeth, but uh, without doubt he was one of the most notable characters from the Elizabethan era. And again, another man who rose through the ranks. He was knighted in 1585, and yet his downfall, and to the annoyance of Elizabeth, was he would secretly marry a lady called Bess Throckmorton. And she uh, was one of the uh, Queen's ladies-in-waitings. Ladies-in-waitings. Ladies-in-waiting. So, again, though, you see, even with Walter, he must have tried really hard to win uh, Elizabeth and make the relationship work. But Elizabeth did as she did with all the others, and she just refused to go that extra mile. So, up until that point, Walter had had a blemish-free record. He'd been knighted, achieved much at court. Uh, but because he forgot to mention this minor little detail to the Queen, uh, him and his wife, Bess, uh, would end up being banished and uh, in fact they would uh, be able to mull over their decision at Her Majesty's pleasure within the Tower of London. So uh, so it, again, it's, it's, it's really difficult. It's really, really difficult. Oh, Janet, good evening, Janet. You've just joined. You've no need to apologise because you've not missed much because I think I've been on mute for about five minutes. Uh, I'm not on mute at the moment, but I think I have been. Um, uh, but, 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 but marriage wasn't about love biting. No, that's true, in ain't yeah, quite right. And it probably, in, in some cases, today it's probably not. Um, but anyway, the final one we're going to have a look at is one of Elizabeth's foreign interests. Now, Frances, and as as Nika gone, is she still here, Nika? She'll, but she'll definitely put me right on this one. Frances, who was the Duke of Anjou, now Anjou, I think I'm okay. And now this bit, Alonson. Is it Alonson? Is it it's not Alan Con, I think it's Alon Son. I think that's how I pronounce it. But with me talking on here tonight, I'm just going to call him Francis. So if Nika, Kings of France, get here. Yes, she's there, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, anyway, I'm going to carry on, Nika. If I see your message, I'll see it. Um, so Francis and Elizabeth, and uh, you could call this a grab a granny. Because at the time, Francis was only 24 years old, and Elizabeth was 46 uh, but uh, there was something that they had this couple obviously found love with each other uh, and the really funny part about it all is Elizabeth had a nickname for him now do any of you guys know good evening Thomas do any of you guys know what Elizabeth's nickname was for Francis the Duke of Anjou anybody I'm gonna I'll have to give it a few seconds because it takes time to come through <clears throat> Uh, ba -ba -ba. pronunciation was good thanks Anika yeah thanks I have to get one right Frog Aunt Maddie straight in there Frog yeah well done Maddie yeah she used to call him Frog uh, and incidentally uh, the name Frog uh, first uh, when it first appeared it was then used as a slang uh, to nickname all French people and that particular name went on for years and years in fact for centuries it went on and on and on but from what I know about uh, this uh, story about the frog is that it comes from a piece of jewellery she was wearing at the time. Now, I'm not sure if it was uh, maybe a necklace or an earring. It was some piece of jewellery. Maybe some, maybe one of you guys know exactly what it is. Um, but it's quite funny to think that she looked at this, looked at Francis and just said, you'll now be known as Francis the Frog. I mean, you can't make it up, can you? Rib it, exactly, Ruth Ruthann, rib it. Exactly. So, so that being said, Elizabeth, uh, they were very fond of each other. And flirting aside, could this be the man that would, after all, become the one to wed the Queen? Well, I'm not even going to give you a chance to answer this one because the simple and predictable answer to that, as with all of other men, was, of course, no. It was never going to happen. Never going to happen at all. The reasons, um, the reasons behind it are quite interesting. Uh, there were obviously voices raised at court with many still objecting to the romance. Um, and uh, Walsingham in particular was one person who stood out and said uh, that she shouldn't marry him because he was a Catholic. Uh, and I think it uh, ended up that uh, Elizabeth realised Walsingham was probably correct in his statement. And by 1581, she gave Fr Francis... The push, the big heave-ho, and he went away like the rest of them. Uh, 
No, is there any more messages on here? Her mouse, her mouse. Where is that a mouse? Is he Aunt Maddie? It still is in America. Oh, right, it still is in America. Okay, Maddie, don't keep it to yourself. It is a, it is a slang term. And it probably is still used in certain parts today. People probably still use these, these terms. But it just shows, I mean, talking of slang, it just shows how many years it actually goes back. It goes back, well, 400, at least 400 years, if, if it was coined first by Elizabeth. Um, anyway, that was about it for the Queen. She'd once again enjoyed the company and quite possibly the premise that he might just be the man. But of course, he wasn't. And it's again, it's something we'll never know. There's so many questions, but there's never enough answers. And assumptions will always be made. And I guess it's for you people out there to make your own opinion. Because you can believe one historian over another and that's absolutely fine i have no problem with anybody believing what they think is true right and correct the only people i think who are um who, who can possibly give you as as good a reply as any are the likes of david starkey and the girl uh, oh, oh, oh i can't remember her name lady at the tower i've got to look this up on my phone can't remember her name. Ba -ba -ba. No, it's not on there. Um, somebody who works at the Tower London. That's my phone. Two, one. Uh, Tracy Bowman. Tracy Bowman. She's a historian. Works at the Tower London, and they've got access to all the facts. Uh, and it is, it is, you know, they're the people probably out of everybody that if you're going to get as near, well. It's, a, it's wrong to say the truth. You will get the facts as they were written in the time. We all know the Tudors were um, not brilliant at, uh, at telling the whole truth all the time and they would write stuff that kind of suited. So you may get half a story, but you'd never get the full story at all uh, because that's just how they were in those days. Uh, the one definite we do know is that Elizabeth as I said before, just loved to be loved. Uh, but at no time in her life did she ever want to take any of those relationships to the next level. And it is absolutely fascinating stuff. It's just really, uh, it's great to, to read about this stuff. Uh, any more messages? I'm just going to have a quick look down. Marie P. Hello from Belgium. Good evening, Belgium. And hello, Marie. Thanks for joining me. Susanna Lipscomb. Yeah, she's good as well. Um... What else we got on here? I love France too, Nika. Yeah, of course you do. Uh, you live there. No, you don't live in France, do you? Oh, I shouldn't have said that. I've just given a big secret away. Although I've not told them which country you do live in. Um, what else we got? Where do I live? I don't see people calling French that word. No, you don't, Lorraine. You don't. I mean, like the, the slang terms are kind of are dying out like a lot of the old uh, words and terms now. They're not really used anymore. Uh, but it was used, uh, the, the, and I'm sure... There's plenty of terms for the uh, for us in England. Uh, what do the Australians call us? What do the Australian call us? Um, they've got names for us. Maddie, what do they call us in America? What's the slang term for a, a British person, an English person in America? Anybody? Tracy Bowman. Yeah, that, I couldn't think of her name, Anita. Yeah, that's why. I just couldn't think of her name. Yeah, she's... Tracy Bowman is top notch. Poms, that's the one, Claire. Thank you. Poms, yeah. So yeah, these slang terms have uh, have gone on forever and ever and ever. And uh, but they are dying out. They, they're like a dying dying race, I guess you could call them now. Um, so what we're going to talk about next? What we're going to look at next? Okay, now we're going to have a look at what is quite possibly uh, the most memorable part of Elizabeth's reign. It was her war with Spain and the Spanish Armada. Francis Drake and his band of sea warriors openly invited Elizabeth to expand the fight and go directly for Spain, but she held back, preferring negotiation to aggravation. Yet the Spanish were not so controlled in their measures and in 1588 sent their armada, which by now had appeared in the English Channel. It was now time for the Queen to stand her ground and she did so with remarkable ease and superbly directed her forces. Her speech to the men goes down in history 
as one of the most memorable calls to arms ever, and it worked. The Spanish fleet scattered, driven away from the shorelines of England. However, defeat did not stop Philip of Spain from sinking to his knees. Still, it did cause enough consternation throughout Europe. What was once known as the Colossus of Spain had at last been stunned into silence. Elizabeth was without doubt the heroine of the hour. The heroine of the hour indeed she was. Uh, Mary, perhaps it was her upbringing, the many marriages of her father and the execution of her mother. Good point, Mary. Thanks for that one. Uh, Lorianne again, I have noticed a lot of words and meanings are either being changed or forgotten. Yet yeah, that is very true. Uh, thanks, Nika. Uh, you have a good night's sleep. Uh, thanks for joining me tonight. It's been uh, it's much appreciated. Thank you for that. Uh, anybody else going off to sleep? <laughs> I th I'm definitely going to sleep when I've finished doing this. I, I need to go and have a, a long way down. Anyway, let's get back to this um, Armada stuff. Uh, yeah, she, like I said, she was definitely the heroine of the hour. Uh, and it's one of those massive uh, moments in anyone's reign. Um, I'm just going to be a little bit serious for a few seconds here. Uh, again, war is not something that should be treated lightly. Uh, and quite possibly, Elizabeth possibly, uh, probably thought long and hard as to the decision. As we all know, war is a terrible thing. And we all know... Uh, about the uh, and possibly more poignant today due to the current events in the world at this time which I obviously don't want to go into but uh, we obviously send our best wishes to everybody concerned uh, with regards to that at the moment um, but this the Armada was by far the most challenging period of Elizabeth's reign uh, the Spanish were first spotted in the English Channel on the 29th of July, 1588, uh, sailing towards the English coastline. Um, now, you've got to close your eyes for this bit and imagine the, the sound of the sea beneath you, the billowing sails, cannon at the ready, and uh, the, uh, the sailors on the Spanish ship saying, here we go, let's kick England into touch. And that's not uh, a rugby term, that's just me surmising what the Spanish may have been saying themselves. Um, Philip of Spain, for numerous reasons, uh, wanted to control his old enemy and overthrow Elizabeth. And what we know of the battle, while well, that started, has been pretty much well recorded. Um, the Armada landed at Calais on the French coast, uh, and that was uh, basically to pick up some extra troops and the Duke of Parma. Uh, but the English sent some fire ships into their fleet, causing mass panic, which forced the Spanish to break ranks. Uh, but they managed to get back together again and then sail closer to the English coast. But when battle commenced once again, the Spanish were beaten away and were directly hit, which caused some significant damage. Uh, I'm just seeing if there's anything coming through. You have to bear with me. I'm going to keep pausing because I need to keep... I can't keep up with all this messaging between you guys. Um, yeah, so this is... I find this really strange. The Spanish have been beaten up pretty much in, in a big way by, by the English uh, boats and ships. They fled north. Now, for me, if I'd have gone out of the channel... I'm surely the best way for them to go would have been south. But they went north, they went up the east coast of England, across the top of Scotland, but then came back down the Irish Sea. And who were waiting for them? More English ships. And they gave them another beating, battered them once again. Uh, and by the time, in fact, uh, the, the Armada arrived back in Spain, almost half of their fleet had been destroyed. Uh, so... There you go. I, I can't work out as to why they did that and why they didn't just take that shorter route, but, you know, that's what they did. Um, it was not just a, a famous victory, this one, uh, because at the time, uh, the English had silenced what could have been called one of Europe's superpowers. They were that big, the uh, Spanish. And many people at the time looked to Elizabeth as ruler to engage, and engage she certainly did. Her by now legendary speech to the men at Tilbury Docks before the fight goes down in history as probably one of the most outstanding calls to arms ever. And she did a great job and rallied everyone. 
She had the full backing of not only her council, her soldiers, but the people. And it was a brave move, but one, I guess, that just had to be done. And in my opinion, to save the country from, well, who knows what might have happened, everything had to be protected, and it was uh, an in line. Which she said, uh, sorry, the line at the beginning of the uh, Elizabeth video, I find it's extraordinary, uh, and it still resonates to this day. Uh, and it's the part where she says, "I know I have the, uh, I know I have a body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king." And it's just an amazing quote from Elizabeth. She was, as we all know, a very strong-willed woman, either with people, a council, and of course foreigners after the intensity of war died down elizabeth was then portrayed as gloriana does anybody know where the term gloriana comes from anybody know montana everybody's talking about montana and some other places oh sorry tracy you have a question carry on yeah i've just seen it go on you ask your question Oh, that's your question. Who taught Elizabeth her languages? Uh, initially, it was Lady Brian, and then, as far as I'm aware, Cat Ashley took over that uh, took over that role. So yeah, so Lady Brian initially, uh, and then oh, Catherine Champernown, who went on to become Cat Ashley, but everybody knows her as Cat Ashley. So yeah, she was the one that uh, that took it on eventually, and Elizabeth was apparently amazing with languages absolutely amazing so uh, yeah she had a good teacher uh, and she learned really well um what was the same uh oh yeah the part about um ba 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 gloriana does anybody know where gloriana come from i don't think anybody's put an answer to that um it came from a poem by edmund a guy called edmund spencer and it was titled the fairy queen yeah, you got off subject, Jody. I'll let you off. I'll let you off. You can go off subject, it's fine. Less pressure on me if you go off subject. Uh, it was entitled The Fairy Queen, and it was a title, uh, Gloriana was a title that stuck, and one in which Elizabeth embraced. And who can blame her, as it defined her golden age uh, beautifully with a name like that. Yeah, Tracy, yeah, it's Cat Ashley, yeah. Uh, and so finally, uh, in this little section... We are now going to have a look at the uh, final months of Elizabeth uh, and obviously pretty much very sad times these. So we're going to have a quick look at this and then a quick run through to the end and uh, I will try and catch up with some of you guys and maybe we can have a quick Q&A or something uh, when we've got through this next section. So this is the last clip as such. There is the exclusive clip. Stay to the very end to watch that, which is this weekend's upcoming film. But for now, I'm going to play you uh, a little part uh, towards the end of Elizabeth's life. It would be the year Elizabeth addressed her parliament for the last time. Her speeches had always been given with great care, even from her earliest attempts. However, on this occasion, her voice resonated with all her ideas into one crescendo. Known as her golden speech, it epitomised her relations, not just sovereign, but also the people. A golden address that would end a golden era. Elizabeth never named a successor. She would be the last of the Tudor monarchs, but by far the greatest of them all. She knew Cecil was planning on asking James of Scotland to become king upon her death, but by Christmas of 1602, although now frail and quite ill, it is safe to say she probably had little to no care who came after herself. Elizabeth's work was at an end. She had lived the most tumultuous life imaginable, but one in which she shone. She brought a nation from its feet to be the proudest throughout Europe. She died on the 24th of March, 1603. Not just a queen, but one of the greatest queens the kingdom had ever seen. Yes. Uh, you can't really argue about that. She certainly was possibly one of the greatest queens uh, the kingdom had ever seen. Now, the final months of Elizabeth are sad, and in this time she would give her last speech to Parliament, except that, uh, and also accept that James of Scotland would take over the role of King of England, and not to mention some of her closest advisers, such as Walsingham and Burley, would also die 
in this time frame. Uh, Aunt Maddie, I got a new computer yesterday. These pigs are gorgeous. Oh, good. I hope it's I hope it's a good computer, Maddie. Look after it. Clean it every day. Dust it. NS, that's tomorrow's date, right? Uh, I, I don't know what you're talking about, NS. If you mean, yeah, tomorrow would have been, if that's what you're talking about, tomorrow would be the anniversary of her death, yeah. Uh, where are we? I've lost track. I'm trying to keep up with these messages. It's me, Betsy. I'm so late, but glad I made it. We'll go back and watch the beginning later. Yes, you certainly be able to, Betsy. Thank you for joining me. Uh, we've still got a few minutes left. I've been on for nearly an hour. My throat's nearly dead. Um, it was Queen Mary. It was Mary Queen of Scots who became king after Elizabeth, right? Oh, Mary. Yes, correct. Sorry, yes. Mary Queen of Scots' son who became king after Elizabeth. Yes, correct. Anita. Anyway, final months. We've just gone talking. We're, we're going getting sidetracked a little bit. Did Did Elizabeth have a secret love child? No, she didn't. Tracy. No, she never had any children. Um. So Elizabeth fell sick and her reign was uh, almost at an end. Although she was told to go to bed and rest, she completely ignored it. Uh, and Queen Elizabeth died, as we've just mentioned, on the 24th of March, 1603 at Richmond Palace. Uh, and if you missed the beginning, it is 419 years to the day tomorrow uh, that she actually died. Uh, and it was a sad ending, but I guess, you know, everything comes to an end inevitable she'd reigned for more than 40 years she'd become a part of the uh, fabric of the country uh, and initially uh, from for the country anyway that was initially on its knees but uh, through her had raised its flag once again to new heights and her portraits convey what can only be described as a leader she was very astute. Uh, she was someone who would reorganise a country that at the time was politically in a mess to one that just worked. It just, all the cogs started rolling in the right direction and uh, it just began to work correctly. And yet there will always, like we said earlier, there will always be uh, opinions uh, against that uh, view uh, that don't agree, you know, and that's fine. That's absolutely fine. So it does leave us with many unanswered questions. I guess overall her reign was peaceful. Her maturity in uh, handling situations was commendable and uh, her leadership, uh, her everlasting leadership of England was without doubt uh, miraculous, uh, especially in keeping it all together. Elizabeth shall always be in the hearts of many people and even to this day look up to her as one, if not the greatest rulers ever to rule England. And with that said, that just about brings us to the end. I'm just trying to scan these messages that are scrolling up and down here. Uh, who's talking about poisoning? Somebody's talking about poison. No, I don't know what that's all about. Um, anyway, if you have not seen the whole video, please go watch it. It is on the channel. It'll take... Uh, a lot less time for you to watch that video than it will to watch me go through this again for another hour. I think the video is about 23 minutes. Uh, and if you've uh, if you've already seen it, please go and watch it again. I'm joking. I'm just joking on that one. <laughs> so to end the stream, we've been on for an hour. I think this has been pretty amazing. To end the stream, I want to thank everyone who's been with me uh, on this journey tonight. It's a first for me. It's certainly a first for the channel, uh, and I think it's been pretty much mistake free, except for that two or three, maybe two or three minutes when I decided to be on mute and talk to myself, as I thought may happen, uh, and it did. But there you go. Um, and finally, don't forget if you like what you've seen, not only tonight, but some of the videos currently available, then by all means, please, please, please consider subscribing it uh, it would mean a great deal to me uh, and it's great um if you were uh, what else can i say to you i've got that many things i keep looking at these messages i'm trying to think of things to say to you to keep you entertained or edutainment as i put it um don't forget you can also count this is what to mention you can also catch me on twitter Facebook and now did a Instagram. Yes, I've just started Instagram. I think I've got 28 followers 
Uh, it's pretty amazing. I'm just uploading pictures uh, from uh, some of the trips I've made around the country. There's lots more to come on that. But um, again, it's a bit time consuming, but I'm trying to find time to, to do as much as I can. Uh, so uh, just bear with me if you don't get things every single day. Um, if anyone, this is the final thing, if anyone wants to drop me a donation, this can also be done through my uh, Buy Me A Coffee page, where you'll find lots of the stories I've made into videos for the channel and some illustrations to help tell the stories again. Uh, so before I go, and before you watch, don't leave yet because we've still got the uh, preview video for the weekend it's only like 60 seconds it'll give you a little insight into what's coming up at the weekend uh, any last requests i'm just gonna have a quick look down this message board uh and thank you lady d thank you thank you very much for joining us i'll quickly run through these lorianne thank you ruthan next time bring water i have actually got some ruthan but i'm talking that much i don't have time to drink it so i will get around to drinking it shortly uh lolly brady thanks uh Bet say thank you bl2001 thank you appreciate it lady d thank you uh eve num eve number even even amber even amber thank you again for joining maddie as always thank you Lorianne, brilliant marie p it was good i subscribed a long time ago I'm glad you did marie hope you keep enjoying the content Anita, good night. Don't go yet, Anita. I've still got this video to show you. Love your videos. Tanya, thank you so much. Aunt Maddie, once again. D Stew, fantastic show. Thank you for your work and time. Really interesting. And enjoyed this. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. And if everybody does like stuff like this, I will try and do another one in the future. Uh, is there anything else to say? Uh, Ruth Ann, uh, Kiss, uh, Kiss, I can't pronounce it. I'm shocking. Kiss Kaya. Kiss care? I hope that's right. I really appreciate you joining me tonight. Thank you. Timeless, thank you. Jodie, thank you. Sorum, enjoy that. Thank you very much. Right, and with that said, I am going to get myself out of here. Uh, and I'm going to leave you with uh, a, a, an exclusive clip uh, for the next... Uh, Shane's here. Shane's just arrived. <laughs> Good evening, Shane. Uh, I'm going to leave you with an exclusive clip. Uh, and don't forget, you'll be able to catch up. Uh, uh, if you missed any of this last hour you'll be able to catch it uh, very shortly it will be going live uh, on the channel right i've got to go thank you very much good night and here is the exclusive clip for this weekend's upcoming video hope you enjoy it see you all again very soon bye bye In 1286, when Alexander III died, there was no one to take his place as the King of Scotland. The nobles who were left asked for advice from England and the ruling monarch, Edward I. But the reply came back that John Balliol, or the first Earl of Carrick, should take the reins. It was in fact Balliol in the end that won the right, although his tenure was purely in name only, as he followed orders from Edward. But within four years of Balliol taking the throne, he was just as swiftly removed, arrested and then sent to France, never to return. Edward now saw his opportunity and invaded Scotland. It was now that the second Earl of Carrick had seen enough. The English had to be removed so Scotland could once again enjoy its independence. Both Carrick and his closest friend John Comyn decided on a plan. One would attempt to become the king while the other would regain all the lands held by their respective families. They made their choice and the second Earl of Carrick, better known as Robert the Bruce, if successful, would become king.